Welcome to the M4 Music Festival. Welcome wherever you are, if you are in Bern or Roosevelt or Gibenach or Neuenburg or maybe in Zurich as my guest Brandy Butler is. Hi Brandy. <laughs> and my other guest, Michael Leake, is in Catalonia. Welcome, hey, yeah. everybody. Thank you. Um, I am looking forward to an inspiring conversation about roots and reinvention. Brandy and Michael, they shared many hours to prepare this conversation, this talk. We're going to listen right now. It's not only a conversation between them. You all are very welcome to participate. This is an event where you can share your thoughts, your questions, your ideas and your experiences. Write a comment on YouTube or Facebook or hop in. We have plenty of time after the talk between Brandy and Michael. You can log in on hop in. You find the links on YouTube and Facebook as well. Before we start, I want, to uh, I want to thank our partners for making M4 Music possible. Thank you, Migo Kulturprozent, and thank you, Swiss Diagonal Jazz. I'm your host, Rina Telly. Hi, Brandy. <laughs> Hi, Michael. How you doing? I would say the stage is yours. You prepared a lot. I don't want to steal your time. And I'm happy to listen what you're going to say right now. Yeah, Brandy, do you want me to fire it up or you want to do it? That's right, you can start. Sure, great. Um, so yeah, as you said, Rena, um, Brandy and I had, had a, uh, quite a few conversations this week um, talking about, uh, I think, a subject that applies to many of us as musicians. Um, which is basically the answer to the question, how do we go about learning music that is not that of our cultures in a, in a way that, um, that is respectful and, 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 um, uh, and, and, and not just re respects the tradition, but in a way that also allows us to find our individual voices within it um, because I think in any musical tradition it's it's essential that we don't just replicate the things that have been done in the past but that we use the history and the context and um, especially especially speaking about culture and community in order to find our own space within that to find our own voices because I think as musicians most most of us are um, on this kind of search to find what our place is and and how we can best represent our own musical fingerprint, which is unique to that of anyone else's in the world, um, in the absolute most elevated possible way. Um, but I, I think that, uh, you know, this is a much deeper question than, than it might seem at, at first glance, because, um, you know, when we're talking about learning a form of music that comes from outside of our culture, Uh, there's a lot involved with that. Um, some things that are obvious and some things that are less obvious. And so we have to uh, put ourselves in the position to be as informed as possible um, in order to move forward on this journey. Um, I'm here in this conversation because I'm a white musician who plays pr primarily black music. Um, and I think in that way, I'm not so different from a lot of the people who are in this conversation who play jazz or funk or rock and roll or blues or gospel or hip hop or, you know, any, any uh, number of, of genres that um, come from African-American culture. Um, so I, I see my role in this conversation as, as being maybe a bit of a mirror um, to the people uh, who look like me, who are playing um, this form of music. And, and, uh, and as the conversation goes on, you know, Brandy and I will be diving into a, a lot of different things, um, and also sharing, um, our own backgrounds and our own stories in the hopes that that can, um, create some bridges with the people who are, who are watching and listening to this. 
I think it's also, I mean, I think that's a great introduction to the whole thing. And I think something that we both talked about a lot this week is how do we create a space where this is possible? Because as you explained, the discussion is, it couldn't, it can be difficult. And I feel like it asks a lot of each person to reflect uh, about their relationship with perhaps a music form that they love and consider their own and to look, take a step back and look about how they've developed the relationship thus far and how they could look at it from another perspective it, perspective or develop it even further. So from both of our parts, I want to say that the, it was very important for us both that we say um, in our own, how we uh, dialogue with each other, but also in the conversation that we want to hold space for after this talk is finished, that we think it's really, really important to say, like, we want to build this space, this kind of safe space, that it's a space for learning. There are no wrong questions. Um, we want to make conversation. We want a place that's compassionate and um, that we are kind of going off of this idea of instead of calling out, calling in, which hopefully um, there will be a, a link for everyone in one of the platforms that you're on so that you can read about it was in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago. But the idea is just that in order for something to be meaningful, a converse, for meaningful conversations to be had, you have to build meaningful relationships to the people that you want to discuss them with. And I think it's such an it's such a nice example because Michael and I this week we really talked a lot, and now I feel like we really built yeah. something. Yeah, we built something meaningful between us to have the difficult a difficult discussion in a lot of way and to think about how to 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 make this for everybody the the most accessible and welcoming space possible. Absolutely, yeah, um, and and I think it's also interesting that you know the, the over the context of our conversations this week. Um, you know, a trust developed and the, the, we were able to, to talk more deeply, um, about things as, as it went on. Um, and hopefully over the next hour and a half or, or however long we have together, that, that, that will also happen between everyone here in this conversation. We'll obviously be moving at a, a more rapid pace, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, so I'm just going to give a little bit of a, a quick background. I think it'd be good um, for for Brandy and I both to do this just so that everyone in the room, uh, the virtual room knows where we're coming from and, and uh, where our perspectives come from, because I, I believe very strongly um, that uh, we have to speak from our experiences as as humans, um, you know, and, and, and or as musicians or as educators or whatever. Um, and and as I uh, say before every, you know, music class that I give, um, you know, to me, everything that I say is a hundred percent true <laughs> because obviously everything that I share with you is something that I believe in because I've lived that experience. But, um, by the same token, someone else could come in tomorrow and say the exact opposite of me. And it would also hold that those things that they would say might ring true to them. Um, so, uh, so I, I would like for everybody to engage at least with what I'm saying as, as, um, my opinions based on my experiences. And so now I'm going to kind of give you my experience in as short of a, of a way as possible is that I grew up, um, as a, uh, white American kid moving from military base to military base, which was a great, uh, training for being on tour, <laughs> I guess, you know, learning how to say hello and goodbye very quickly and easily to people. Um, but also because I was a military kid, I never, really was able to feel like a part of a community or a culture because this is a very transient community as, as military children. Um, you're moving to a different state every few years. Uh, so I lived in California. I lived in Alabama. I lived in Virginia. Um, and when I was 18, I moved to Texas to study jazz at the University of North Texas. Um, I spent four years there. I dropped out. Um, largely because I was already playing a lot of gigs and I felt like that's why I went to school in the first place. And actually, um, you know, the school that I went to was exclusively white professors, probably 95% white student body. Um, and by a very, very strange stroke of good luck, um, I was asked to play at a, at a terrible jam session um, for $50 for four hours on a Sunday night. 
I didn't want to do it. I had just played like my third church gig of the day, which is a big thing in Texas. And I took, I just said yes, because I say yes to everything, you know, basically still, you know. And I went to this gig and it was terrible. You know, there was nobody there really. A couple people came to play. And one of them was a trumpet player named Philip Lassiter. And he heard me playing something that was like, we played like a funk version of something. And he said, oh, do you, you know, do you play electric bass? And I said, yes. Um, and he said, can you uh, play at my church next week? So I went, I said, sure. Um, I went to play at the church and uh, the band at the church was Roy Hargrove's RH Factor, minus Roy. So this was a huge shock to me. Um, not just meeting these people who I had worshipped, you know, and based my band off, really, Snarky Puppy was then maybe three or four years old, um, just made up of university students. And um, this was an illuminating experience to me in a lot of ways. Um, but, but I finished the church gig, and after the show, one of the members of the band asked me to play in his band. And then immediately I was just kind of thrown from this very white, academic you know, collegiate environment into a very vibrant, thriving African-American music scene in Dallas, Texas. You know, the, everyone from Roy Hargrove's band, Erica Badu's band, Kirk Franklin's band, Fred Hammond's band, Marcus Miller's band was all from there and living there at that time. So my scene changed like very quickly. And, and basically I spent three years only playing in that scene at, at mostly in, in, in churches um, and, 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 and black R&B and jazz clubs. Um, and for me, you know, this was a, a, a very, very eye-opening experience um, because even in that first week of playing on that music scene, I felt like um, everything that I had been studying suddenly made sense. <laughs> like all of a sudden, all the records I grew up listening to, I was hearing that sound around me for the first time in my life even though I had just gone to four years of like jazz university, you know, which was a deep thing, you know? Um, and, and also in this moment, Snarky Puppy, I told Snarky Puppy about what I was experiencing living in, in Dallas and playing on this scene and my band started coming down. And then there was this really beautiful mixture of music scenes that still continues to this day in Dallas of the kind of collegiate scene in Denton, another city nearby and the black scene in Dallas. Um, and then I was mentored by a keyboard player from uh, Queens, New York, named Bernard Wright, who was my mentor for three years. He lived with me for a while. And, um, and, uh, and through this relationship, um, Brandy was talking about creating relationships, but through a daily relationship of sharing conversations and playing together. And, you know, I was setting up his keyboard at gigs and all this kinds of stuff. Um, you know, I, I engaged in a form of education that's ancient which is the kind of master and apprentice form of education, um, and also more relational than sitting in a classroom with 50 or 550 other students and learning something that was created in, 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 in the street, you know, inside of some classroom with a projector and PowerPoint, you know? Um, so then I moved to New York and, and, and now I work as a producer. Um, I still have Snarky Puppy and I still have another band called Bocante. Um, and I, and I largely work as a, as a producer. Um, but I feel like the most relevant part of that story is the shift that happened when I actually engaged with the community that had birthed the music that I was dedicating my life to play. Um, so I think that was the, the shortest way, even though it wasn't short that I could possibly describe my context in this conversation. And the last thing I want to say also is that, sorry, is that, um, you know, as musicians, we're all students, um, and currently, over the last three years, I've been spending a lot of time studying music from Morocco and Turkey. Um, so I've been going there. I have teachers there. I do Zoom lessons when I can't go. Um, I lived in Istanbul for three months and um, go to Morocco like four or five times a year. Um, and, and I want to bring up that my process in learning, trying to learn these forms of music, which I don't plan to play professionally, but I plan to incorporate in variety, a variety of ways, and also just to learn um, that this process of learning these musics um, I feel is similar, if not identical, to the process that I, at a certain point, took and feel we should all take in terms of learning um, jazz or whatever kind of music comes from outside of your culture that you love. So, sorry, Brandy, that was very long. 
but no interesting i mean it's interesting to hear all of these ways that you um intersect with the culture and how this influences you and then i think of my experience and my experience is totally different because i um i grew up in reading pennsylvania which is like an hour outside of philly and uh, my mom is white and my dad is black black american and um <clears throat> for me um my dad was a very very important function in my life uh, in terms of me becoming a musician like this is he really wanted this for me and here it is and at the same time he spent a lot a lot a lot of time educating me as a child like the first music lessons I got were from my dad like I had one of those old little do 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 keyboard like Casio keyboards and like that's where I learned harmony with him together and he taught me how to sing harmony and uh, like all of these really um special moments of my life I feel like we're also learning the culture like for example the first songs that I learned harmony on actually the very first song that I learned harmony on was la 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 means I love you which is a iconic song you know it's a Philly soul song (laughs) so I feel like these are really um he spent a lot of time actually giving me the culture and also instilling in me, which I feel like is why I'm such a strong activist as well, the importance of being like, this culture is so precious. It must be protected. It must be uh, valued. And it's your job as the next generation to uphold it. And I feel like this is such a huge component of who I am as as uh, as the adult that I am now is like to really think about what it means to come from specifically black American culture. I mean, I intersect completely different with blackness here in Europe because it's a whole other thing, especially within Switzerland. Um, but for me, it's, it's, it's really the threads of who I am. And I, I think often about, actually I ask myself even often, like how much do I really love Luther Vandross? And how much <laughs> is my dad, is that my dad who <laughs> like, must uphold this black music at all costs, right. you know? And, uh, <laughs> I mean, he wanted he wanted black music for me so much, and and we weren't even allowed to listen to, for example, my house. We weren't allowed to listen to white music, and my, I mean, my mom listened wow. to musicals, and that we were allowed to partake in. But like, I didn't know who the Beatles were or any of this until I, way later in life, like until wow. I was an adult, I just totally passed me by, and. Uh, I remember my brother was really into you too. My brother's eight years older than me and he was into you too. And like, this drove my dad insane. Like it was, it was almost shameful for him in a lot of ways. And so when I met jazz in the beginning for me, it, there was also this resistance because I could feel my dad, like this pressure of like blackness being like, you need to do this because we have, we, this is what we do. And in the beginning I was like, no, I, I mean, I, I started as a flute player and I, was playing classical music. And only when I actually left this context, like went out of a space where my dad wasn't whispering in my ear about music. And I found jazz for myself and like played for the first time with other musicians who were quite, I was like 16 at the time where that was where I found the music for myself and, and, and the excitement about playing it with other people, the cultural value was already there. So me, it was, I, I learned to love the culture first, and then I learned to love the music itself or like the form of the music. So it's almost like an opposite kind of uh, path than, yeah. than most people in jazz universities are taking, right? Most people fall in love with the music and then later they engage with or fall in love with the culture or not. Yeah. I mean, what's also really important is my dad was all very much from the school of like, okay, you can learn these notes, but we're learning everything by ear. Like if you don't have a good ear, it's not, you, you'll never make it in this, you know, you'll never be able to play well. So I feel like this is also a really strong component of me is that like, before I ever learned really to read music, I learned to listen. And I feel like this is also just a part of black music in general is a lot of like the, tra- the tradition of improvisation specifically within black music contact is really built on this idea of like who is there who's in the space with you listen to them and find a way to communicate like we talked once about this idea of like this lingua franca of of jazz being this universal way of communication um and that this is actually a gift that i can see in retrospect that my dad gave to me was like learn to listen to who you're in the room with first and then engage in a conversation it's not a dialogue Mm. it's a, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's not a monologue. It's a, it's a dialogue. It's a collective uh, talk with each other. I really love that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, uh, you know, Brandy and I, for, for those of you out there, we, we 
talked about um, creating a like a, a reflection toolbox, basically like some concrete steps that we can all take as people who are um, wanting to learn. It doesn't have to be jazz. It could really be anything that comes from outside of our culture. Um, but before we jump into that, um, I, I want to address like something that maybe many of you are thinking, which is like, you know, I don't feel like jazz is foreign. I feel like it's my my music or, um, you know, I feel comfortable with it and I've studied it and practiced it. Um, and uh, and I want to just bring up a, a thought basically that I have because I'm teaching it at, uh, in, at a conservatory in Barcelona this semester. And we have an ensemble that's called the Black American Music Ensemble. So we're studying um, and performing music from different regions of the United States, one region at a time. Um, and on the first day of class, we had a conversation um, about why is it that people feel that jazz, but also rock and roll and also funk and also hip hop, why do people feel that these genres are just belonging to the world where we would never say that flamenco is just a global music genre that belongs to everyone or Carnatic music in, in India just is a global music genre that belongs to anyone or gamelan in Indonesia or any of the, the musical traditions of the world, we would really think of those as specific to a certain country, a certain group of people, a certain culture and a certain community. Um, and we would engage in the study of that genre accordingly. But for some reason with these genres of black American music, we don't necessarily feel that way, including white Americans, you know, this is not my music that I play at all, even though I have the same passport as people whose music it is. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of reasons for this. There's a lot of reasons for why people believe that all of these forms of African American music are just belong to the world. Some are more benevolent than others. Um, some of the reasons. And I think one of the primary reasons is because this music is ubiquitous, that you find it everywhere you go, largely because of the United States' marketing machine, that, that this music has been pushed out to every corner of the world and is in every restaurant and every shopping mall you know, on earth, whereas gamelan music maybe is not. But that doesn't mean that we don't have the responsibility to investigate this music in the same way that we would investigate flamenco or carnatic music. And what I tell my students is like, how would you feel about a kid in Alabama taking flamenco lessons from another guy from Alabama? You know, how, how, how much would you trust that experience, you know, and what would that student need to do in Alabama in order to engage with the flamenco community and flamenco music in the most um, elevated way. So I just want to, I want to put everybody in that headspace before Brandy dives into this toolbox that we should be looking at, at, at these forms of music um, the same. I think it's also a good moment like, to just insert this quote. I thought I found it was so good, <clears throat> excuse me, by uh, Leroy Jones, who was a famous uh, Black poet from the 70s and kind of comes out of the same space as Gil Scott Heron. Um, and I think there's a there's a real word of like legacy of like how we respect the legacy of something or what what do we deem as a legacy. And and his the quote is, as Western people, the cultural thinking of 18th century Europe comes to us as a legacy that's continuous and it's organic. It's part of the 20th century West. And the sociocultural philosophy of, of, of Black music in America deserves that same respect. Like we look at classical music and we can see this legacy of, ah, oh, there's a whole history behind it and, and we study it like this. And I feel like Black music does not, has not been afforded the same thing, but we should be looking at it in the same way, which means that, I mean, a lot of it is a learning process. Like I, I know many people who still think that techno was made first by white Americans and that that is not true, you know, or that punk music came from the UK and that is not true. There's so many, there's so much influence of black music throughout the world that doesn't get treated with the same feeling of like, this is a legacy and a history that is, should be respected and should be studied as such, as you, as you said before, 
And so with that in mind of, of respect to this legacy, let's move into our, our toolbox <laughs> that we kind of dreamed up together. And I think it's so good to say, like, we kind of bounce these questions back of each other, like where we play devil's advocate, like, why should I learn this? Why is it important to me? And Michael said this so good. He was like, learning is always a good thing. You know, this, you have to engage with this music, with the fundamental idea that like, you don't know everything, you can always learn more and that learning is a good thing. Always. And curiosity, <laughs> yeah. curiosity is like, it's the start of, it's the, it's the basis of our praxis, no matter what may, music you make, curiosity and excitement for that music, to learn that music, to, to be inside of it is so important. And uh, the last thing I think that's also important to say is like, this is never, making music can never be transactional. And if you want it to be transformational, it has to be relational. I'll just say it again. So this is not transactional. You can't buy it. You can't, it's not something you can, you can purchase. If you want to be transformed by the music that you make, it's got to be built on the relationships that you have to the music, to the people, to the culture, to your musicians, to the history, to the legacy. Hmm. Absolutely. Um, so I guess, you know, to start dive into this toolbox, we're basically saying, okay, you know, how do we do this? How is this done? Um, and I think we have to ask ourselves certain questions, you know, questions that I wish I would have asked myself before that jam session in Dallas, you know, <laughs> it would have saved me a lot of time and I would have grown a lot faster as a musician. Um, and the first question is, what is your proximity to the culture that you find yourself studying? Um, so, you know, for my students here in Barcelona, their proximity to that culture is 6,000 miles away. Um, and the closest thing they have here is me, which is not great. <laughs> but it's the best that they've got is a person who has, um, you know, built their career and spent their life um, studying and, and uh, studying black music and, and playing in that community. Um, so, you know, for my students, I tell them like, you can't leave it there. I can't be the closest thing in your lives that you have to the, to the culture that you're studying. You know, you need to figure out ways to, to engage. Um, and, and of course this is according to your means. Not everybody has the money to go and move or, 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 you know, study with, with certain people, but we have to do the best we can. Um, and then another thing I'll share in the, in the kind of, how do we do this idea is, um, a, a thought, which is that just because you have a relationship with someone does not mean that you're seeing the depth of their experience and therefore not really seeing them. And as an example, Snarky Puppy has been a band for 16 years. We, we have... Latino, Asian, and black members of the band um, that have been a part of the band for 13 of those 16 years. And um, I thought that, you know, because of my friendship, very deep friendships with the black members of the band, um, that, and the, and actually the Latino and the Asian ones, that everything had been put on the table, that we had discussed everything, and that I had like a kind of good understanding of, of their experiences. But after George Floyd's murder in the United States last year, um, I had a conversation on a, a, a private Zoom conversation with only myself and the black members of the band, um, which was interesting because it was the only time really ever in the band in which there was like a 90% black majority, which changes the course of a conversation. You know, um, so uh, and in this conversation, a lot of things came out, a lot of things came out, a lot of experiences they had had over their lives and how certain experiences made them feel that I was also a part of. But I didn't feel that same way. And I didn't know that they felt the way that they felt. They didn't share it with me because they didn't feel that I would understand or be able to handle it or I don't know. Um, but the bottom line is that I in that moment until that conversation um, I considered myself to be a person who really understood black culture more than most white people in my country. And that was a moment in which I, one of many in which I realized I absolutely did not. Uh, there's a whole other 
thing happening that I had no idea about. And the fact that I have black friends or that I play black music or whatever, my girlfriend's black or my, my, my girlfriend is not black, but my, my cousin is one of my, one of my aunts is, but it doesn't mean that I know what's going on. Um, so I think it's also very important to recognize that there is a fundamental difference in the experiences that you're having maybe as a Swiss white person and that Brandy's having as a Swiss black person or that I'm having as a white American and that my drummer is having as a black American. Um, and and uh, one of the best ways to attack this is to try to create open communication principally by listening, basically by opening up and really allowing people to express themselves without you defining that experience for them. Yeah. I think, I mean, this is this com coming back to this thing, the initial thing we said about calling in, I feel like a large part of building a calling in culture is building this fundamental thing, which is like, let me step back. Let me listen to what somebody has to say. Let me give them space so that they can feel safe to say what it is that they experience and not, not put my, my own experience on top of it, just give them space to let, to hold actually. I mean, these for me are uh, in my own experience of this last year, the most meaningful moments I've had have been moments where people gave me space to explain how I felt, mm -hmm. what it was like, and didn't try to say, but I, but I didn't, and I, or I know, or I mean, just, just let it, just hold it for this moment. And that makes such meaningful bonds and it also kind of goes along this idea of that, like, not every relationship that you have has to have, like, productivity, like, intertwined with it. Like, there doesn't have to be an end result, which is, like, we resolve it, which in some ways that we discussed, this is a very American concept is, like, we don't like to hold conflict for a long time. We like to get, get it done by lunch, dinner time at latest. But sometimes mm -hmm. I think it's just nice to um, free yourself from the idea that conflicts can immediately be resolved. Sometimes they also can't. Sometimes there's no answer to it, or sometimes you won't even be able to see something and experience that someone has, but that doesn't mean you can't hold it for them and therefore create a much more re meaningful relationship to a fellow musician or uh, yeah, someone completely in your world that has a different experience from you. Right. And I think the, a good analogy for that is how we deal with our emotional relationships, like our intimate relationships. And, and, you know, that I'm very much from this white American culture of like, solve the problem, find the problem, analyze the problem, create a solution, fulfill the solution, you know, and, um, you know, and I've had a lot of experiences like with my girlfriend where, you know, she'll be talking to me about something that's upsetting her or bothering her or frustrating her and immediately I go into this like you know problem solving mode and the truth is in that moment she doesn't want that <laughs> you know to put it very lightly she's not interested in me solving her problem she's interested in me hearing how she feels yeah. because she has you know especially especially when we're talking about things with gender you know that she's dealt with a certain kind of thing her entire life and it's bottled up inside of her and it comes out, you know, she expresses it in small ways. Um, and in those moments, it's not about me trying to solve sexism in Spain. It's about me listening and being open. And, um, and I'm not saying that, I, I mean, I've, I've really had to learn how to do that because it's not my instinct. So there's been a big unlearning process for me in terms of how to deal with that as well as um, applying the same thing to music. Yeah, I think it's definitely, I mean, you can absolutely apply this to any any culture that you're in uh, or musically and, and engaging with people who are from this culture to understand that like, it's the, you can just hold space. You can just listen. You can just, and I feel like specifically in terms of black American music, this is something that I feel like is part of the problem of why um, we look at these musics as uh, jazz and, and all of these black American music inspired musics as, as property of the world is because there hasn't been, uh, a, a, there hasn't been space given mm -hmm. uh, to this culture to be listened to. And actually a lot of these forms of music that were made were 
literally musical forms of protest against not being heard. I mean, hip hop is literally a form that was made out of like oppression in New York City in the 70s of like minorities being oppressed and, and, and you know, like them taking the streets and, and you know, bootlegging light poles to get electricity so that their voices could be amplified at such a level. So, yeah, I think this slides us right nicely into this idea of privilege, recognizing it and knowing what it is. Maybe you want to, I'll, I'll let you explain it. Sure. Yeah. Probably better if I do. <laughs> no, I mean, that's the thing. I also have privileges. That's not, I mean, I also, we said yesterday, like, do you experience privilege? I think as a Swiss musician, the answer is immediately going to be yes. The city of Zurich for alone, just they, they gave out money to COVID mus for musicians. They gave out maximal 8,500 bucks. This is a huge privilege. We have lots of privileges here within this context. Totally. And I, and I think that, yeah, I mean, when we're uh, looking at the word privilege, you kind of have to unpack it and say like, okay, what, what exactly do we mean when we say privilege? Because mm -hmm. in 2021, when the word privilege comes up, it normally is referring to white privilege, right. but privilege is not limited to the privilege that white people have, as Brandy just said. Um, you can have privilege in a variety of ways. And so what does privilege mean? Basically, privilege means that you have something that others don't have based on circumstance um, or the best way that I've heard it defined um, because in my country, a lot of white people were saying, well, how can you say that I'm privileged? I've had a horrible, tough life. I've had to fight for everything. Um, and the way that I've heard it best defined is that privilege doesn't mean that you're not having a hard time or facing extreme difficulties. It just means that you are not experiencing those difficulties because of the color of your skin or because of your gender. There are white males who have very, very difficult lives in this world and black females who maybe have less difficult lives in this world. Um, so it's not like a blanket thing. It's just isolating why we have accesses, access to the resources that we have access to. So, I mean, immediately, if you're white, you've experienced privilege over groups of people who are non-white. Um, I would definitely say for myself, I never thought that that was the case because I worked my butt off every day and still do, you know, from the second that I started Snarky Puppy to get what the band has gotten, you know, and the whole team, my whole band and everyone, we've all worked so hard. So for me, I always attribute it, attributed the, 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 what success we've had to the work, which the work was maybe the most important part. But there were other parts to why we were able to do that. If I, I looked back and said, wow, had I been a, I don't know, a, a South Asian woman, would I be in the same place that I am right now? Would I have been treated with the same respect by festival directors when I was mailing demos out? And th these kinds of things. And I think we really have to ask ourselves this stuff, you know, I mean, especially this is a conference in Switzerland. You know, I would say that if you compare Switzerland to most even European countries, there's a lot of privilege. You know, you have a society that has a very strong infrastructure. There's public funding for the arts. You know, there's a school, what, I mean, 10,000 miles away from the birth, birthplace of jazz that has some of the greatest living jazz musicians going there and teaching because there's money in Switzerland for them to do that. You know, and I think we really have to analyze like and look at what we have going for us um, and in a, in a realistic kind of way. So I think then the question would be like, that I feel most people would ask in this moment, like in a, if you were in a position of def feeling defensive, let's say you're listening to this conversation right now and you're feeling defensive about your position, um, how would you explain it to other musicians to say like, why, why do you need to do this? Why, how mm -hmm. would you as a white person explain this to other white people, specifically in terms of like engaging with music not of your culture. Why, why do you need to do this reflection? Right. Yeah. And so basically, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a, it's a very benevolent idea to want to create our own spaces because I'm sure a lot of people are watching this and thinking like, yeah, but you know, I'm trying to do my thing. I'm not from new Orleans. I'm from burn, you know, and I want to create my own sound and do my own thing. And yes, like a thousand times. Yes. That is the goal. That's why we're having this conversation today is to try to help push that goal forward. 
But this cannot, this desire to be individual and independent and create your own thing cannot come at the expense of acknowledging the history of the music upon which you are building your individual vision. Because when, when you say, I want to be my own person, I want to have my own voice, my own sound, well, it's physically impossible for you to create something that isn't the combination of other things that you've experienced in your life. You can't imagine a new color. And you're not going to be able to imagine a new sound that isn't a combination of sounds that you've heard. So as we said earlier, learning is always good. And it's just going to empower that innovation. When we look at Mingus, Charles Mingus, who innovated jazz, he worshipped Duke Ellington. You know, he was super hardcore about studying Duke and all of this thing. So, you know, it's this idea that in order for us to move forward, we really have to go back and do the work, do investigation, research, engage, all these kinds of things. Um, and, uh, and I'm oh, sorry, go Bernie. No, no. I also think it's important to say like the, 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 what we have been fed about these cultures, like when you go to school for jazz, what you're getting told in the school is jazz is also just a small portion of what actually made it. Like you're getting, you're getting the best of album most of the times, you know, and you're missing all of the other things that went to the, all the other elements that made, um, something become that in the first place. So the, the research of diving into the culture and asking yourself like, okay, if I'm thinking about bebop and I think bebop is Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie, they're not the only people. There were so many other people that were instrumental to this music form being uh, becoming the thing that it became. They were at the front of the train, but there was a lot of other people riding along in it. And so I think this is in, in this idea of understanding like, okay, maybe, maybe what I got or maybe what I think I know is really not. I mean, even as a Black American, I think... My own culture, well, we have Black History Month, you know, we got the best of hits of Black people, which is like, ah, oh, it's Martin Luther King and, mm -hmm. and it's Rosa Parks. And these are also the people you know as, as Europeans. You also got, you got the, the best of the best of. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the people that were so instrumental, for example, to the civil rights movement, you don't know them unless you really set yourself out with this topic to explore who are the other people? Who were the other musicians? What did they sound like? Can I find them? And I mean, these days, there's so much access. We have so much access on the internet to so much information. YouTube is like, a, it's a library of, of music and of, of videos. And you can literally travel back in time and see so much, so many more things that, for example, the generation before us didn't have access to. So we really can have a lot more connection and get a much broader picture of a culture if we dive into it. Right, which is always fueled by curiosity, which I love the, mm -hmm. the highlight that you've put on that word. Brandy, so I know we only have five minutes, so I wanna, I, there's just really two things that I feel like we should, um, we should launch into um, before this conversation. And I really hope that this conversation that Brandy and I have been having um, is, uh, inspiring a lot of questions because the, for me, the, the interesting, most interesting part is the next part when we, when we engage in a discussion, um, together because, uh, and as Bernie said, there's no, no, we can start, you know, there's no bad questions. Everything is open. Um, but I want to ask a kind of controversial question that Brandy and I talked about in, in our, in our conversation yesterday. Um, because, you know, I, as I said earlier, the, the idea of all this research and history is to, to fall further in love with the culture and the community that birthed the music so that we can create our own voices within it. Um, but I, I, I brought up a point yesterday, you know, a question, an interesting question, which is, does a non-black person have the right to engage with black music equally, or which you could also apply to, does a non, uh, you know, Indian person have the right to engage with Carnatic music? Um, and I think that this is a, an, um, I think it's an interesting question because, uh, well, Brandy, what, I mean, what, 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 what do you think? I mean, I think fundamentally we both agree the answer is yes, that everybody, like this is the beauty of music is the possibility to engage. Music is a language and to learn these languages and to be able to speak to people in them and with them is the, is part of the gift of existence for me. It's what makes this whole thing tolerable. And, uh, but I also feel that specifically in the context of black music, I feel like we're in a space of time that 
is difficult because I, black music has been so disrespected mm. uh, in such a large way that I, I understand that there will be a, uh, not everyone will feel the same way. Right. And I think that this is okay for me personally. I think it's okay that we don't have to all feel the same way about stuff. That's actually also the nice part about being human is we all have different opinions about things. But I don't think that this should discourage you right. as a musician, whoever you are, from wanting that for yourself and from doing the work to know it. Because I feel like the best way that you could ever respect any form of music is to get into it as deep as you can and engage with the culture, engage with the people, listen to the stories. I mean, I feel like part of black culture, part of the work, like you were saying, the apprenticeship, the old school way is you have to do a lot of listening to stories of people telling stories yeah. and it's so valuable. It's so it's, it gives you so much richness of what this thing actually is. Right. And so I, I think it's, there's not a ban it's nobody's telling you, you can't do it. I feel like there'll be different feelings about how close you could come or what it means. And I think that that discussion is okay and right in the time that we live in for sure. But I feel like don't, don't think of it as a, an exclusion. It's an actually, it's an invite. It's for me, it feels like an invite for you to know it even more intimately. Thank yeah, you so absolutely. much. Brandy and Michael, I'm so sorry the time is out. I was listening with ears like an elephant. I wrote down so many questions. <clears throat> and I'm looking very forward to meet you in the other room. I'm looking forward to meet you all outside on Hop In. There we can chat and talk with Brandy Butler and Michael Leake. Please share your questions. We'll be back in like five minutes. And a big thanks to Migro Kulturprozent and Swiss Jazz Diagonal for making this possible. Thank you so much and see you later on Hopin. <laughs>